Whatever happened. Hello, this is the lecture for European uh, history for Monday, the 13th of December, 2021. People are making sure that they are in uniform, or I am making sure they are in uniform. I suppose that everyone is in sort of uniform, sort of. Yeah, not exactly. Fine. That's okay. <laughs> The king is in the process of being executed. France has rebelled. The king tried to escape and failed. Ultimately, the king will be executed. His wife will be executed. His son will be abused to death by the lowlifes of Paris. And, um, well, it's only getting worse. The people in charge of Paris are not the National Assembly. Remember, the French Revolution has a Janus-type face. There's the happy face of the Revolution, which are the National Assembly's politicians, and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, Liberté, Egalité, Fraternité, the cockade of uh, blue, white, and red. Um, yeah, uh, white for the House of Bourbon and blue and red for the colors of Paris. But the people actually in charge in Paris are various elements of what would be called the Paris mob. In this case, the sans-culot, the guys without culottes, the men without knee breeches. See, working men wear trousers that go down to their ankles, but the aristos, they wear culottes, knee breeches, pants that go down to here, and then you wear white stockings with them or booties or whatever. So... The sans are the working men and skilled craftsmen, so in other words, lower middle class, of Paris. And they have taken over from Le Poissard, the fish ladies, in terms of running the revolution. Now, when a neighbor's apartment catches on fire, you don't let it burn, <laughs> because your apartment's going to go with you. The other countries of Europe, slow to respond. Finally... By 1792, are responding to this disaster that's going on in France. Disaster from a traditionalist, uh, monarchist point of view. Um, and the Austrians and the other Germans, Prussians and so forth, are going to relieve the situation by launching an invasion of France. And this invasion isn't to take French territory as much as it is to save hierarchical civilization from the mob. Now, they could have put the crown prince of, of Prussia in charge of the uh, army. He was young and energetic, and he was from Prussia, which is the modern Sparta. But no! They put the Duke of Brunswick in charge of this army. The Duke of Brunswick is an old man, a tired man, a cautious man, with a long, old, long, long ago reputation of military competency. But he's a compromise choice. He isn't going to offend the Austrians or the Prussians or any of the other Germans. The Duke of Brunswick is given command. So, the invasion of France is not going to be a bold strike, a coup de main, a, uh, a fast operation. No, no, no. It's not the way the Duke of Brunswick operates. Slow, methodical preparation, step by step by step. The tortoise and not the hare. He is reliable, the Duke of Brunswick, but he is slow. And he begins moving in towards Paris. Now, whenever... The Duke of Brunswick's forces encounter French Revolutionary Guards. The French Revolutionary Guards hurl insults at the Germans, and uh, yeah, and then the Germans volley fire into them, or fire cannons, or a combination of cannons and volley fire. And the Revolutionary Guards run away. Because seeing men blown apart around you is sort of demoralizing, especially if you're used to being, well around civilians that are unarmed that you can bully. Just a wee bit. The German army, uh, the Germanic army, the, the army of German allies, 
is, is not like that. So the Duke of Brunswick gets into the habit of going almost through this ritual dance. The, Ger the, the Germanic army under, under Brunswick arrives, uh, the French hurl insults, the Germans fire into them with discipline, and the French disappear. He gets used to it. Now, as the Duke of Brunswick is approaching Paris, one of the Jacobins who said of uh, killing the king, revolutions are not made with rose water, or revolutions are not made with perfume, Georges Danton comes to the fore. Georges Danton, or Danton, is a revolutionary leader and an intellectual, but he doesn't look like an intellectual. He's a red-faced, boisterous man who likes wine, women, and song, who likes carousing with the French uh, revolutionaries, with the people of Paris. And uh, he says famously, Lodas, boldness, 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 and more boldness, and the fatherland will be saved. He rouses the manhood of Paris to go fight these invading Germans, these monarchists, these counter-revolutionaries, and Danton actually inspires the creation of an entirely new army to join the revolutionary guards that are trying to slow the Germans down. Boldness, boldness, and more boldness, and the revolution will be saved, and the fatherland will be saved. But everyone in Paris is nervous because these monarchists are a professional army, and we don't really have a professional army anymore. We've got revolutionary militia. And the difference between a professional soldier and a militiaman is demonstrated every time the Germans fire and the French run. And then the Duke of Brunswick decides to do something bold after all. He sends a public message to the people and leadership of the revolution, to the people of Paris and the leadership of the revolution. You revolutionaries are holding a number of royal and church prisoners. And you'd better not harm a hair on their head. Because if you do, doom will come with my army to Paris. I don't know if you're familiar with the tales of Uncle Remus. They've been suppressed because they're not politically correct. Song of the South was a Disney movie I saw when I was a child. It's a song, a story of Uncle Remus, who's a black slave, sort of retire in retirement, who is the storyteller for children, black and white, on this plantation. And since Uncle Uncle Remus is not a Uncle Remus is not a firebrand revolutionary talking about killing the white people, uh, it's considered to be a, a movie that is glorifying glorifying slavery. Even though the most positive and charismatic, char charismatic character is a black slave, eh, I don't I don't understand certain things. In any event, um, the most famous story from Song of the South and Uncle Remus Tales is of Brer Rabbit or Brother Rabbit, and Brer Rabbit is uh, a talker. The Bugs Bunny comes from Brer Rabbit in the sense of this fast talking, clever talking rabbit character. And I think it's, I forget uh, what predator Rare Rabbit meets. Do, does anyone know? Is it a coyote or a dog or a wolf? Yeah, fox, fox, yeah. And, and basically, Rare Rabbit meets Rare Fox. And Rare Fox is going to eat Rare Rabbit. Brother Rabbit is going to be eaten by Brother Fox, Rare Brother. And Rare um, Rabbit says, well, it's better that you eat me because uh, at least you're not throwing me in that, in that, in that briar patch. God, I, I'd hate it if you threw me in that briar patch. Oh, please don't throw me in that briar patch, Rare Fox. <laughs> Which is psychological warfare. Because um, the fox, being a cruel little twerp of a person, of a, of a creature, goes, oh, really? You don't really want to? Uh, wee! Wingo! And, and now, Rare Rabbit is uncatchable because he's surrounded by thorn hedges. Don't throw me in that briar patch. The briar patch is a thorn hedge. Brer Fox can't get in. Brer Rabbit can. 
So Br'er Rabbit has just talked himself out of being eaten. <sighs> Don't tell people what you... It, 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 uh, the psychology of the Duke of Brunswick's message is questionable. Yes, I'll interrupt my story for your question. There's a song called Song of the South by Alabama. Uh-huh. Have you heard that song? No, I, I, I may have, but I don't know it by name. I just reminded me. Okay. Uh, so, the Duke of Brunswick has just told the people of Paris no, what not to do. Now, they think uh, we're probably going to have, you know, conquered and the revolution will be slaughtered and you know what? The saint Coulomb speak for the mob of Paris. We are not, not, not going to allow those aristo bleeps to survive us and take over. Oh, the Duke of Brunswick says, don't touch them, don't harm a hair on their heads. We'll show them. And this initiates what history calls the September Massacres. Because the prisons of Paris are full. They are fill, filled with noblemen, noble women, noble children, priests, monks, and nuns. They are filled with supporters of the Ancien Regime, of the old government, of the king. They are overflowing. They are overly crowded. The saint Coula arrive leading the Paris mob, breaking into the prisons for three days and three nights. Every man, woman, and child in those prisons, if they're rapeable, is raped and then killed, and if they're not rapeable, is simply killed. The blood literally clogs up the rain gutters. For three days and nights, the blood flows from these prisons. It is an act of bestial violence, and it shocks people around the world, especially those who had been supporting the revolution. Thomas Jefferson, who's a Francophile, who likes the French, famously has to find a way to try to defend this act of wanton slaughter. The September massacres clarifies opinion overseas. The British particularly become uh, absolutely resolute against this revolution, because this revolution is not what went on in the, United, in the American colonies. Nothing like this happened in the American colonies. Thousands and thousands and thousands of prisoners, including women and children, slaughtered for three straight days? So. At least the people of Paris told the Duke of Brunswick where he could get off because um, <laughs> they didn't listen. They did exactly what he told them not to do, uh, just like Br'er Fox. <laughs> and it didn't work out for Br'er Fox, and we'll, we'll see right now if it works for the Duke of Brunswick. The Duke of Brunswick is getting closer to Paris. Slowly, methodically, his army has moved towards the French capital. And at this point, Danton's new army is going to meet the Duke of Brunswick's forces at a small town called Valmy. The Battle of Valmy is a small action, but it is a turning point battle in world history. Why? Because the Germans arrive and uh, the French insult them and the Germans uh, order their troops to fix bayonets and volley fire into the mob, and they hit the they hit the they hit the revolutionaries with cannon, and the revolutionaries don't run. The revolutionaries hold, almost like they're committed, almost like they're professional soldiers. And the Duke of Brunswick moves his troops up to threaten. You know, if they're not going to run after we shoot at them, maybe they'll run when we hit them with bayonets. The French hold. They hold. That's all they do. The Duke of Brunswick has not yet committed his full army. He just, he, he did the, uh, hmm, and, and they didn't flinch. Uh, he's killing them and they're fighting back like soldiers. Duke of Brunswick still has a much, much superior army. <laughs> but the Duke of Brunswick decides, hey, they're fighting back. Let's go home. <laughs> we'll come back next year. If they're going to fight back, this isn't what we expected. That We got used to them uh, leaving. 
when we shot at them, and now they're not. So turn around and back to Germany. Ah! So the revolution is saved at the Battle of Valmy by not running. The French uh, Revolutionary Guards have finally demonstrated an ability to fight and preserve their revolution. And it was too much for the Duke. I'm, I'm, not, I'm telling you, it was not a major battle. He did not commit his forces. Had he done so, he probably still would have won. But he had gotten used to it. He'd gotten used to the easy victories. <sighs> okay. The revolution is going to intensify after this. Intensification. The mob is at this point going to be constantly incited, like boiling water with heat under it. And one of the chief sources of revolutionary heat is uh, the newspaper of Jean-Paul Marat. Jean-Paul Marat's newspaper is L'Ami du Pope. L'Ami du Pope is the friend of the people. The people's friend. They're the people's friend. People's friend. In any event, I'm quoting from that guy in Luther. People's work. The friend of the people, L'Ami du Pope, <laughs> is produced by a rather short, wiry individual who comes to Paris and tries to ply his trade but can't afford lodgings. So, if you've ever played an Elder Scrolls game, Morrowind, or Oblivion, or Skyrim, or even Fallout 3 or Fallout 4, you know that you have to sleep every so often. Your, your character in this video game needs to sleep. If it doesn't sleep, you're going to get tired and you're going to be lousy at all the things you like to do, like fight and kill mutants or orcs or whatever. But if you can't afford a bed or a room, it's kind of tough. Well, if you're in a city, you can go into the sewers and you can find a place to sleep in the sewers. And that's, you know, even today, in today's cities, a lot of homeless in New York, there are whole tribes of underground homeless that uh, live uh, in the many tunnels under the island of Manhattan. I used to live in New York. I, it was fascinating to me. And sometimes these people come up and sometimes they don't. And they live in the dark, except for the, you know, the lighting that the city provides in terms of subways and, and so forth. But there are a lot of tunnels under the island of Manhattan. Marat goes into the, uh, the sewers of Paris because he needs a place to sleep. But there he contracts a horrible skin condition. A skin condition that doesn't go away. In fact, it spreads over his skin. And it causes an unstoppable itching sensation. But he could scratch his skin clean off. It's not going to stop the sensation. In fact, it'll make him sicker because the skin that protects the rest of his body from this horrible disease, uh, this fungus, whatever it is, um, is going to get better access to his body. So Marat is an angry man. He's a bitter man. He's a man that think, like, thinks life has wronged him. And then the revolution comes. <laughs> and in the revolution, in any revolution, are opportunities for men like Jean-Paul Marat, for men to aim their anger and outrage and vent their bile. So L'Ami du Pope becomes the newspaper of the saint Coulot and Le Poissard and... The, the extreme vanguard of the Paris mob and the most radical of French revolutionaries. And the problems that the revolution is facing are always the result of counter-revolutionary spies. Counter-revolutionary spies and agents. Agents of the uh, Ancien Regime, agents of the king or his family, agents of the Duke of Brunswick or the foreigners, agents of the enemy. It's, it's never because governing a country like France is hard. Uh, it's, it's never that the revolution, even if it was an established government, would have difficulty doing certain things. Or that the revolutionaries might be making mistakes with their priorities or their policies. No, no, no. 
counter-revolutionaries and spies. And if the problem of the French Revolution is counter-revolutionaries and spies, then there is one answer to solve all our problems. Heads, heads, and more heads must be taken from traitors and counter-revolutionaries. Monsieur Guillotin's invention must be used more willfully, more boldly. So, one of the things that's a feature of L'Ami du Pope is they publish lists of traitors that L'Ami du Pope has discovered are counter-revolutionaries. And many of those people are just killed. Because if the newspaper says you're guilty, you know, you'll go through a revolutionary trial in a people's court, but chances are... Marat wouldn't publish your name under the appellation of traitor unless he had reason to. And if Marat has reason to call you a traitor, you're probably a traitor. And if you're a traitor, you're going to die. You're going to be guillotined. Do you see where this might have a tendency to possibly go off the rails from, from time to time? That uh, occasional injustice might be done? in the name of the people and their friend. So the revolution is intensifying terror tactics. Marat is cheering it on. The provinces have not yet spoken much in terms of the revolution. It's been primarily a phenomenon of the National Assembly and of the city of Paris itself. But up in Normandy, a woman named Charlotte Corday, like many provincials, is looking on in horror at what's being done to her country. And Charlotte Corday, I think, is a woman of courage. Revolutionaries call her Judas in female form. You can decide. Because Charlotte Corday identifies Marat as the linchpin of all of this violence, this ongoing terror, this intensifying revolutionary zeal for heads, heads and more heads. So, she gets a stiletto, places it in her hairdo, and goes to Paris. She travels in revolutionary uh, carriages. Uh, she arrives in Paris, asks where L'Ami du Pope is published, where Marat's house is, and everyone knows because he has an open door policy. Anyone can come in and tell him at any time of day problems with the revolution. I mean, in this sense, he's a he's a genuine newspaper man in that this is his passion. But Marat is very famous for not receiving people normally. See, the only relief from this horrible itching is to be immersed in herbal water, hot herbal water. So Marat is habitually in the bathtub. He has a bathtub in the center of his working space. He's in the bathtub, you know, with water and, and mint leaves and other things like that. Uh, and he'll receive people in the tub and he will write things down or he's got a scribe or whatever secretary to write things down. And um, he has an open door policy. So Charlotte Corday arrives and and Marat's people uh, let her in when she says that she's got a list of people from uh, Normandy who are uh, traitors. Uh, and, Mar you know, this, this is new. I mean, it's, they're not from Paris. They're from Normandy. The woman comes all the way from Normandy. He's going to see her. So um, she says, I want to tell you the names, but I want to tell you quietly. And he says, come closer. And she, 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 and she, she kills him. Awesome. Now, she does not run. She allows herself to be arrested. And in her revolutionary people's court trial, she says, yes, I, I, of course I killed him. I killed him in front of witnesses. I'd do it again. Because with him dead, some degree of order can return to my country. He was constantly calling for heads. This needed to stop. I know I'm going to die. I know I'm going to die tomorrow or today. But with him dead, at least my country can, can return back to normal. Well, she was executed. 
However, it got worse. Marat is the martyr of the revolution. At the cathedral in Paris, they take the Christian altar away and they place Marat's bathtub where the altar was. Prayers to the saint of the revolution, Marat, spirit of Marat, infuse me with the courage. There is a almost Latin funeral mass, but it's not Christian, it's not Catholic at all, uh, to uh, publicly mourn the passing of the publisher of L'Ami du Pope. The streets of Paris have their names changed from the names of saints to the name of Marat and several other revolutionary leaders and martyrs. And the terror will increase. Now, in the provinces, in western France, north of, well, south of Brittany and uh, north of Bordeaux, I think this is, this is Bordeaux, I think it's Bordeaux, um, is a hilly forested region called the Vendée. The Vendée erupts an anti-revolutionary revolution. The Vendeans like their aristocrats. They like the Roman Catholic Church. They like their traditions. And they make it clear that we are going to live in our old way. And if anyone from Paris or the revolution comes a calling, they'll die if they come into our territory. Leave us alone. The Vendée is actually going to be a serious problem for the revolution. For six years, every revolutionary army that enters this region is chewed up and spit out by the Vendeans. The Vendean people, it's, it's not that they're, they're just the aristocrats and the churchmen. The people of the Vendée are genuinely convinced that their way of life is threatened by the revolution. And that the only answer is to fight with every ounce of our integrity and our courage and our viciousness. Because this is a civil war, and true civil wars are absolutely vicious, merciless uh, affairs. So, this is a big problem. In fact, in 1799, when the revolutionary armies finally conquer the Vendée, there are three barges worth of prisoners. I mean, huge barges that are captured. And these are the leaders and uh, leading members of the Vendean resistance that were not killed. And the revolutionaries have these barges towed to the middle of the river and sunk by cannon fire. And anyone who escapes uh, is going to be shot or bayoneted. So the prisoners are massacred in the name of the revolution, because if any of these people get out, it's going to be B.A.D. bad for us. This is what the revolutionaries say. It's similar to the reasons why we kept enemy terrorists at Guantanamo Bay for so long. Because, well, I guess for various reasons we're not going to execute them, but we can't let them go. Because if we let them go, they're going to join the terror war against us again. And in Afghanistan, one of the Many things that happened as a result of our precipitous pullout was that a lot of people that we had in jail in Afghanistan for doing some truly heinous things to their own people and to us are now part of the Taliban regime. In any event, the Vendée is an example of how the revolution is not speaking for the whole of the people. The revolution is speaking for a certain active group of people in Paris, and it also for those people who are involved in the leadership of, of the National Assembly. Now, the two parties that developed, the Giron were in defense of keeping the king alive. They're gone. They're wiped out. They're counter-revolutionary traitors. They're not nearly radical enough. The Jacobins includes George Danton and the leader of the French revolutionaries, the leader of the Jacobins, Maximilien Robespierre. Now, Robespierre is everything that Danton is not. 
Danton is large. Robespierre is small. Danton is fat. Robespierre is thin. Danton has a florid face. Robespierre has spectacles. Robespierre is a lawyer. In his youth, he uh, was he won an award for Latin. And so when King Louis XVI and his new bride, Marie Antoinette, were touring France, he got the ability to read his dissertation to the two of them that were sitting in a cart listening. So he actually read a Latin dissertation to the man he would ultimately have killed and his wife, who he ultimately had killed. Robespierre is called the incorruptible because his zeal for the revolution goes beyond. He doesn't like wine. I'm sure he likes women, but it's not a big deal. He doesn't like song. He's not a gregarious fellow. He doesn't go around and carouse with people. He does nothing but work. And his work is fighting the counter-revolution. Robespierre heads up a new subcommittee that's going to run France during the intensity, the most intense phase of the revolution. It has the euphemistic title, the Committee for Public Safety. George Orwell did not make up this notion of, uh, in 1984, that the Ministry of Peace runs wars, and the Ministry of Truth deals with uh, propaganda, and the Ministry of Love tortures political prisoners. The Committee of Public Safety is a established to conduct terror in the name of the revolution. You might ask, why to conduct terror? And why a man like Robespierre? Well, in the height of the terror, a tailor of Paris gives Robespierre his favorite present, his favorite possession, a brand new suit. Robespierre was always dapper, never a hair out of place, always perfect wig, everything perfectly shaved. But this prim new suit had guillotines on the buttons. And Robespierre loved that suit favorite suit, because he was the man that sent people to the guillotine during the, during the terror and then the, the intense phase, the great terror. So, Robespierre is going to use Monsieur Guillotin's invention. Why? Because in the old days, only aristocrats got beheaded. When poor people were convicted of death penalty offenses, they were hanged by the neck until dead. Now everyone dies like an aristocrat. Everyone gets their head chopped off. But since the revolution speaks for the future, the, the new and improved way, new and improved way of killing people is to uh, not use a headsman. I mean, a headsman, an axe guy, uh, uh, come on. He could, he, could, he could slip. He could be drunk. Every so often, the headsman would cut through the skull or, or would bounce it, or you'd have to do a second or a third chop. It's just there's, there's too much that can go wrong, too much human error. But the guillotine suspends 30, 40, 50 feet up, depending upon the guillotine, this blade that's about this wide and wide, and it's shaped like this, so it slices on the bias, and above it is this big, heavy beam that holds the blade in place. When you pull it, it drops with such force that the head is separated from the body, lickety-split. And I've told you, the human brain can live for a few minutes without oxygen, and there are many accounts of people who've been beheaded by guillotine. This doesn't usually happen with an axeman, but by a guillotine who are actually trying to do things or say things after they've been beheaded until their brain starves of oxygen and finally dies. Why conduct terror? Robespierre once famously said that virtue and terror are the chief ver uh, ideal, are the chief components of a successful revolution. That terror without virtue is monstrous. And what's virtue? We're, uh, liberty, egalité, fraternity, liberty, equality, brotherhood. But there's also just being honest being dedicated, being true. Virtue are those things, those qualities to which good people aspire. That's virtue. So, terror without virtue is monstrous. You just have, you know, violence, uh, anarchy, thuggery, uh, oppression. But virtue without terror is useless! So, 
Robespierre insists that you can be as virtuous as you want. If you're not willing to cut heads off the enemies of the revolution, including the king and his family, then you're just a chatterbox. Talking revolution. Bleep, 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 bleep. Useless. What you need to do is understand that this is a war, and we've got to win the war, and wars are not won through niceness, they're won through violence. Virtue without terror is useless. So the Committee of Public Safety is going to run the terror. I'll be getting back to this. Why? All revolutionaries believe in what psychologists call operant conditioning that you can reward and punish your way to change human behavior. This is what you do with a dog. When I trained my dog when I was younger, we had, uh, you know, we, we, we praised her and pet her and, and fed her little treats when she did good things and light smack on the nose when she did bad things, like go to the bathroom in the house. And she learned not to go to the bathroom in the house. And she learned to sit and stay and do all those things. Very smart dog, German Shepherd. I miss her. But... Um, does that work with people? Well, sort of, yeah, sure. Every Again, every revolutionary employs some form of reward and punishment to try to retrain the people. Well, the Jacobins are no different. The Jacobins are going to restructure thought into a new mold. We're going to rebuild society, and that means rebuilding every person in society, and the way you do that is terror. You make people so afraid that they're not willing to do anything without thinking first, is this revolutionary enough? Is this revolutionary enough? So you execute people for saying, Bonjour, monsieur. Bonsoir, madame. Good day, mister. Good evening, ma'am. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Because the honorifics in the revolution, everyone's a citizen. Citoyen. Bonjour, citoyen. Bonsoir, citoyen. Good morning. Good day, citizen. Good evening, citizen. Everyone's a citizen. If you say monsieur or madame, you're thinking old thoughts, and old thoughts are wrong thoughts, and wrong thoughts must be punished without mercy. And you punish without mercy to create terror. It's like using comrade. Yeah, it's the same. Again, the communists didn't invent everything that they did. They got a lot from the Jacobins. They got a lot from the Jacobins. No, uh, uh, Vladimir Ilyich uh, Ulyanov, Lenin's, um, Lenin's role model was Robespierre. And a lot of his enemies called him Robespierre because he acted like Robespierre, vicious, absolutely pitiless, absolutely cold in service to the revolution. So terror is going to be used for the same reason that a person is traumatized in military training. Some of you will undergo military training, basic training. You will choose to. We have a volunteer force. And what the military will do, whether you are a coastie or a Marine, to some extent, is they will take you apart. You won't get enough sleep. Your clothing won't fit. You're going to have to do all the physical things that a person needs to do without enough time. Everything must be perfectly clean. You've got to constantly be thinking on your feet. You cannot forget a single thing. You're given so much information. It's like trying to swallow water from a fire hose. And it's going to overwhelm you. And it's going to break you down. And that's on purpose. Because what basic training will do is destroy the civilian and replace that civilian with a new military person. Soldier, sailor, sailor, airman, marine, coastie. Your mind is being trained to think in the midst of battle. And the way that we simulate that is the shouting of the drill sergeants, the shark attack. Five or six drill sergeants at you at once, and you've got to respond. And if you don't respond properly, you're going to do push-ups, you're going to run, it's going to be horrible. But you learn, you either you either adapt or you or you or you wash out. You learn to function in a moment. And you also learn to do certain things by muscle memory. Like take your weapon apart, clean it, put it back together again. They want you to be able to do that in the middle of a night battle. If your weapon jams. You've got to be able to take your weapon apart, clean it, put it back together by touch. 
And that means all the little parts of the weapon you've got to put down in a ritualistic way so you don't lose it. It's all done to build a new kind of person. And trust me, terror is a part of that process. Because if you don't adapt, one of the things that happens in the army anyway is the blanket party. Because what will happen is it won't just be you that gets punished if you fail. It'll be the unit. And everyone in the unit is going to be sick and tired of being punished because of you. So after lights are out, some of the guys will grab a blanket and pull it over your head and hold you there with the blanket. And others will come with soap wrapped up in towels. And they'll beat you with the soap. Hard. It hurts. It's incredibly painful. But you'll, you, you will not ever forget it. And it will... It will motivate you to learn. That's the point. The military does this because that is the only way to create in a civilian, in place of a civilian, a person that can function with people dying around them in battle. Nothing that we can do in training is as bad as battle. But the key is the best troops in the world have training that's almost as bad. That's why it bothers me every time I hear somebody talking about making military training more humane. That's not the point. The point isn't to make it humane. The point is to make it like war. So that those who go through it, <clears throat> when the bullets start flying and the people start dying, can function. That's the point. The revolution is trying to get people to stop thinking in the old way. To start thinking in the new way, and the only way to do that, according to Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety, is terror. So that's where we are. We will leave it around terror, and we will continue tomorrow. Uh, questions? Yes. I don't, it's not really a question, but Comment. I don't military training more than I don't, I, like you, I don't agree with that, but there's also a certain point where you just make it so bad, and you just pretty throw up, and that's no, not what you need that. No, what American troops are really good at, or have been really good at, is both being functional on the battlefield, but still thinking. A lot of armies don't produce that. They do produce robots, and you need somebody who's an officer to tell them what to do. That was one of our advantages in, in most of the wars we fought. But that's a... You, if you err, you err on the side of toughness, at least during your initial training. After initial training, you can you can revive those other parts of the personality. Yeah, because right, Army Special Forces Green Berets... They, before you actually go to the Q course qualification course, you have special forces assessment selection, which is 30 days and you get to go out front in the woods in yeah. it, Georgia. And yeah. the whole thing is you can pass that training, and if, but if you go through it like a robot, you will not get selected. Right. Because no, you've got to still think. And, work. and I'm telling you, the whole point is to get you not to think. Now, I remember I had a former student who went through ranger training, and uh, he, he was very successful, and he went over to Iraq and did combat. He went through ranger school or rest. He went through ranger school. He went through the proper one, whatever the best one is. Oh, so was he in the regiment? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, he was a full-scale Army ranger. He was actually their youngest NCO at one time. Uh, but he, he told me of a time when he was there with a group, and the tree told him to take a knee. And he took the knee because the tree told him to. And it was because his mind was not, he had he was functioning on so little sleep and so much adrenaline that things like that happened. Yeah, like, see, like when the feels go through hell week, it's yeah. five days of, you know, at, night, at the most four hours of sleep. Yeah. Three the Marines do a similar thing with their, with their, yeah. Uh, crucible, yeah. Uh, and again, all of this is designed to produce somebody who can function in war. Yes. I was watching a video about the Marines, and before you even like get to boot camp, when you're on the bus, mm -hmm. you have to have your you have to hold your bag to your stomach and put your head between your legs, and it makes everybody like super car sick, and like well, like half the bus throughout. Mm -hmm. Well, again, you've got to get used to discomfort, and that's that. It's all on purpose. It's not just for sadism. I mean, you, you, look, I've never been through it. I'm a civilian. I'm blind in one eye. The military wouldn't take me. But I study it because war affects history and history affects war. And the psychology of it interests me. It's not about sadism. It is about preparing people to function in, a, in an environment that's completely horrible. Anyway, we'll talk tomorrow. Thank you. You can talk among yourselves.